Yep, so it's currently being recorded. Oh, it is, to the cloud, yeah. To the cloud. Okay, welcome everybody then. Um, <clears throat> thank you for joining the uh, Radicchio, the Canovi uh, Radicchio webinar. Um, we're gonna be talking about trialing seed selection and various Radicchio musings. Um, I'm just gonna just let everybody know that we are recording this. Uh, you're, we will be able to access it later. Um, and I just wanted to welcome you and do a quick uh, land acknowledgement and a welcome greeting. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can see you. So yeah, welcome everybody. Um, I, I'm David Katzel. I work with Farm Folk City Folk directing the BC Seed Security Program. Um, and I'm also the BC rep for the uh, Bauta Family Initiative on Canadian Seed Security. Uh, I'm currently zooming in from the traditional and unceded territory of the Kwantlen First Nations. Um, for me, unceded is a weird word when working with seeds because this land was very seeded, I imagine quite richly before um, uh, it changed. And for me, reconciliation has to do not with just with the land, but with the work I do as well. Uh, I'm really proud of working with seeds and the food system that I work in but I am aware that I promote a model of food production that's been imposed on top of what was already an existing foodscape and like the land, that food system was never given up. Um, so it's my personal reconciliation work to uh, think and learn best how to weave those two systems together and imagining uh, working towards a landscape that reflects both systems and the people who work with them. Um, so thank you for joining from whatever unceded territory you're on. Uh, as we get going, you can use the chat box for questions, um, but there will be time throughout the webinar, uh, 10 minutes in the middle, 15 at the end for questions as well. Um, I'll mention this webinar is hosted by the Bauta Family Initiative on Canadian Seed Security uh, and in partnership with Farm Folk, City Folk and Canovi. Um, before we get going, I'll just list uh, the order of presenters. Um, I won't maybe introduce each person uh, before each pre presentation, I'll just do it now. So we have uh, Lane Salmon is going to uh, start the presentation. She is joining us from the uh, Oregon State University. She's an assistant professor and she's the director of the Culinary Breeding Network. So she's going to be talking about varieties and various culinary radicchio musings. Um, and then we'll follow that with uh, Brian Campbell from Uprising Seeds to talk about seed production, and Dan Brisbois from Turnisol Cooperative Farm, also talking about seed production. And we'll follow that with 10 minutes of questions and answers um, on those topics. After that, we'll have Alex Lyon, who's a Kenovi researcher and trial manager, um, and Linda Fenstermaker, who's from Osborne Seeds, to talk about the trial and variety selection, and then we'll follow it with a quick uh, a 15 minute Q&A after that. Um, we will be sending out additional videos after the webinar and some information to watch on your own. We have a radicchio fact sheet uh, with some history of the crop. Uh, we have a virtual farm tour from Linnea Farm, and we have um, a full length cooking demo with uh, Chef Andrea Carlson. I think I, sh I sh sent the uh, trailer to everybody previously. Um, so I think we can get started um, and we'll start with Lane if you want to do your presentation that'll be great. Sure okay thank you guys. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen. Um, oops share screen. Okay share. Sorry okay can you guys see this? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so, um, all right, I want to, I'm starting to talk about um, radicchio, um, a lot about outreach and some events and some type of, uh, like just trying to get people really excited about radicchio uh, here down in Oregon and Washington. And I know that you guys up in BC are doing quite a bit of that as well. So I just wanted to kind of share some of those things that we're doing. Um, as you mentioned, I... I work for Oregon State University. I am um, the coordinator for our Novik group, which is like the United States version of Canovi down in um, Oregon. 
and Novik is a Western tier, Western United States tier of um, project that includes um, New York, Wisconsin, and also now includes Colorado, Washington State, and Oregon State. So um, I do um, organize the trials that ha happen down here, but um, there's a lot of people that are going to talk about varieties and trialing. So I wanted to share with you guys some of like the outreach and kind of marketing kind of things that we're doing here. Um, uh, I, I have put in, been put in this position of doing like marketing stuff, but I am not a marketer. I'm an agronomist and an entomologist. So we're doing the best we can, but I think it's all coming, all of us that do this work is coming from such a wonderful place of excitement for this crop that it's, um, it's very authentic and, it, and the enthusiasm comes through. So um, bear with me in my pretend marketing <laughs> world here. So uh, we're calling it the the Radicchio Revolution. What we're what we're trying to do and getting people very excited about this crop as something that can be grown locally and very well when we figure out how to grow the crop um, in the Pacific Northwest. And it is something that can be eat, eaten uh, consumed all um, year, but particularly in the winter months when we have less to eat. Uh, here and when someone would go to the grocery store potentially and go buy lettuce that's from California or Mexico in the United States, we would like them to turn to this uh, bitter green radicchio to um, to consume. So this is like the the motivation here. So a new crop for a lot of farmers that can be growing in the Pacific Northwest to make money in those winter months. So here's a gorgeous picture. Sean Linehan is a, a friend of mine and a person that I work with at the Culinary Breeding Network quite a lot um, and she takes lovely pictures for us in the field as well as in the studio. So this is a variety of different types of radicchio um, that we've been growing around here. Um, and she took this photo and most of the photos are in this. So, oops, uh oh, it's not going to the next. Oh, here we go, sorry. Okay, so just really quickly what the Culinary Breeding Network is, uh, it's an initiative that I started about 10 years ago and the mission is to bring together and build communities within, with, uh, um, within plant breeders, seed growers, farmers, produce buyers, chefs, uh, people that have uh, you know, value added products, all the stakeholders within the, um, the food community, as well as just consumers and eaters to um, work together to improve quality in vegetables and grains. The photos that you're seeing here actually all come from Novik trials. So tastings and planting and evaluating in the field and field days that we've done around there. Um, and the, how the Culinary Breeding Network kind of works is it's, but the focus is I work on doing outreach and kind of marketing and building relationships and community within research projects at Oregon State University and other, Oregon, other universities like Cornell and WSU and others to kind of make our outreach um, more accessible to like the general public and more exciting really, I feel like just coming from a place of where um, people in the general public are at rather than um, more, you know, researchy type things, like maybe things that we would all maybe be drawn to where we would read lots of things, uh, lots of in-depth information and um, be able to consume some more advanced information, but actually making it like a lot more accessible to the general public and like really actually quite a bit fun, right? And also this includes including lots of chefs and bakers and whatnot, because what's better than being able to eat all these wonderful things that we're doing research on, right? So there's a bunch of different projects. And like there's the Novik project down here. There's one called Eat Winter Squash, Eat Winter Vegetables. I work with barley. And then there's the Sagra de Radicchio, which is turning into a larger project, which I'll talk about as we go through this. Okay, so two of the big things that I do with the Culinary Breeding Network is organize events, like I said, like they're really, um, you know, the idea is that they're very interactive and that they're very fun um, to bring people together, but they're also very educational. A lot of times I tell people that it's like a trick. It's like something that is going to have a lot of more in-depth information and more of the things that we really are trying to address in the uh, organic agriculture community where we want to tell people about like the importance of organic plant breeding and about climate chaos and the things that we're having to deal with with intellectual property and all of these things but we do it under the uh like with the idea that this is going to be a very fun event. It's going to be exciting. You're going to meet a lot of people. You're going to eat a lot of food. 
Um, you're going to love it, but you're also going to get a lot of education out of it as well. Um, and then, and also mar developing these marketing campaigns as well to, to attract people to um, all of these things that we want people to be eating that are supporting our local farmers. And then also getting to that point that I'm telling you about what the real education is around those things. So that's what I'm trying to attempt to do in a lot of these projects. And Radicchio is one of those. And here's John Navazio, who's a plant breeder down here in the US uh, in, in Maine at Johnny Seeds. And I just wanted to put this in here that he's saying that winter vegetables are the fastest growing greens market for the seed, um, uh, seed industry. He said the market for these crops and he includes radicchio is expanding faster than any of them can keep up with. So that's very good news um, and exciting news for us, I think. Um, Okay, so we have seen um, in the past couple of years that people are getting very excited about radicchio. It's very helpful that radicchio is beautiful and that more and more beautiful varieties are coming out. The rosa types, the pink types that kind of, it's like the, the pictures arrived in North America before like the, the radicchio was even here. <laughs> I was asking, answering a lot of questions from reporters that were calling from like Bon Appetit and all these different, you know, food, magazines um, before we even had really access to this. So this is something that's very exciting and gets people really um, excited about wanting to eat it. So fantastic. Um, so some of the ways that we're working with Radicchio, uh, with lots of different projects, we talked about Novik, which is, you know, just like your Kenobi in which we are doing variety trials of them. Um, and I think Linda and probably uh, Brian will talk about this later is, um, you know, how we're trying to figure out which varieties to grow and especially the, the planting dating updates, trying to figure out that um, and so that we can be most successful. Um, this project, Eat Winter Vegetables, includes the vegetables that you can see here on this list. And we have a lot of um, outreach um, activities to try to get people excited about all these different vegetables. So it's a different project than Novik. Um, it's less research-based. It's more about promotion. And so we do grow these multiple varieties of each of these out, um, but we don't really take data on them. They're just kind of for demonstration. Um, and then, but we do have a lot of outreach events about them to try to get the general public very excited about them. Um, here's two of the events uh, around Radicchio that we have been working on. Um, we've had the Sagra de Radicchio, which is on the left-hand side. Uh, and a Sagra is a celebration. It's like um, its roots are in Italy, where in small communities or bigger communities, they have celebrations around a food product uh, or a dish, something that they grow in the area that they're celebrating. Um, and so it's inspired by that. And so we have the Sagra de Radicchio that focuses specifically on Sagra, I mean, on Radicchio. Um, it happens in Seattle. It's happened, this will be the third year. We're doing it virtually this year. The last two years have been very successful. Uh, we had a group of Canadians actually come the first year, got really inspired. They've started their own um, the Vancouver Radicchio Festival, which is totally awesome. And um, I was stating before this started, I hope that some of those people are on here. I haven't got to meet them yet, but um, <clears throat> I would really like to be able to kind of, you know, work together, collaborate on, on all of these things on how we all promote Radicchio together. In the future. Um, also, we do um, a, a sagra on the right hand side is the sagra that's special that's specific to the winter vegetables um, that goes along with a, um, a farmer's market, which is called Fill Your Pantry. So this is where you can go and taste all these different winter vegetables, get really excited about them. These are all culinary uh, advocates, cooking advocates, chefs that are telling people, you know, the person in the middle here, Tim, is showing people how to 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 butcher your winter squash because people don't eat winter squash a lot of times because they're afraid to cut it. Um, just teaching about the best way to cook these, prepare these different vegetables, give out recipes and really empower people to go home and to cook with them. Um, so that's pretty exciting. People love it. We had a thousand people come to that Sagra last year. Um, there are 30 farmers and they, we sold like $85,000 worth of produce and other meats and things for at the fill your pantry. Um, this was the room that was very specific um, to radicchio as well as garlic. We call it the exploratorium. Um, we've gotten really <laughs> geeked out in all of our radicchio swag. We've got maps, we've got posters, we've got fun things to get people excited about it. This is 
The people in this picture are um, Siri is in the middle and next to her is Jason, her husband, and they've been growing radicchio for about 15 years and Cassie next to them um, is one of the organizers of the Sagra de Radicchio. So we all organize this together as well as Brian, um, who's on the phone call from Uprising and a couple of, um, a couple of restaurant groups that are in Seattle together do this. Um, so geeking out completely, um, trying to get people to understand the differences in all the different types of radicchio. One thing I didn't put in here is a zine we, um, or a zine. We um, created a little booklet all about radicchio and the different types to try to get people um, more excited about all the different ways that you can, we can find radicchio in the world. Um, we have a website, eWinterVegetables.com. You can find a lot of different resources there. You can get recipes. We've had chefs develop recipes. We have videos, a lot of different information there. So I already told you about the outcome. So this was really great. We had a lot of success with the farmers that were there. It was really nice to have the Sagra along with the farmers that were selling it because we could say, oh, you really like this radicchio. You really like this winter squash. Cool. Like our job is to get them excited about it, let them taste it, give them resources like recipes, and then they walk over and buy it from farmers. So it was really nice to have this combination of an event down here. This is down in Oregon. And this is the Sagra de Radicchio, as, as I mentioned, that's up in Seattle. Um, if you see this top, um, there's Linda and Siri and Brian over there on the edge. That's, um, this is the raw bar in the middle. I think that the Vancouver group did something very similar where you can look at and taste just raw all the different types of radicchio. And then around the edges, there's chefs that are making dishes. Um, and here's our group of the organizers at the bottom. And I'm telling you guys like this much and showing you all, trying to show you all this so that you guys will all get excited about it, hopefully, and take this on in your neck of the woods in Canada and, um, and maybe organize things like this as well and just kind of get inspired by it. Okay, here's some more. This is a picture of my son. So I had to put Pasquale in here, the one with the dark hair. He's, <laughs> he's standing in front of the sign holding Treviso. Um, this is at the top left. This is Brian's really fantastic display of some of his other radicchios that are uh, forced and um, just quite beautiful to get people excited. Oops, okay, next one. Uh, the Variety Showcase is another event that I organize. Um, and this is more about plant breeding. And so this is very much about um, geeking out a little bit further um, and explain the importance of organic plant breeding, ex explain the importance of organic seed work. Um, so this is a variety of tables that you would go to um, and, um, and learn about plant breeding and seed work. Uh, so here's a table. This is Mirta who, um, who's holding the squash here and she's in, in, um, she's in Northern Italy. She actually worked uh, in a, at a, I'm gonna, I can't remember the name of it, but um, in outside of Montreal, she worked at a pretty famous farm there. Um, and someone can put the name in the chat. I'm sure that they know, probably Brian knows. I can't remember it, but everybody knows the name of it. <laughs> anyway, she, she worked there for several years. She's grown radicchio everywhere she's gone. Um, there's a table there. Um, this is our big table that we had focused on uh, a lot of our radicchio um, community. Um, Osborne Seed was in here, Wild Roots, some, far, uh, some chefs that we work with. Um, just really geeking out on radicchio and spreading that love. Um, this is from Brian. This is the Uprising Seeds table. Um, they had bites of the, a French um, um, beet and as well as this Isotina uh, radicchio. So it just really putting together some really fantastic educational tables as well as like very beautiful to get people pretty engaged and wanting to learn more about radicchio. Um, one thing that you guys said that you wanted me to touch on today, and I can't get into all of it because that it would be like an hour by itself to talk about this radicchio expedition that um, I organized with uh, that farmer in the north, um, Mirta. We uh, organized a trip for 22 farmers, um, seed growers, and chefs from the United States to go visit her um, for a uh, for an event that she was organizing called the Jazz that focused on winter vegetables, um, where she is from, from in the Alta Adige region. And we took a tour of different radicchio growers in, um, 
in the Veneto as well as north of there. And so this was a display that Sean, the photographer, put together for the, for the variety showcase. And it goes into detail about all the different places that we visited and some photos. So quickly, I will show you that these are all the individuals that came with us. Uh, here's Mirta on the left with the blue hat. The person that's talking to you, Lane, myself in the middle, is in the white jacket. This is a farmer named Andrea Piton that was showing us some breeding work that he was doing with um, Rodicchio. Um, we learned an incredible amount of Rodicchio growing it, uh, the culture behind it, the background of the crop while we were there. We hope to go back again. That was the plan. Um, COVID has messed that up a little bit. We had um, a plan for a lot of intensive radicchio work in the next three years. We will still do that. We'll figure out how to do it without having to travel until we can travel. Um, but we, we plan to continue to have relationships with these farmers uh, and seed growers, which I'll show you in this next slide, um, to bring them here so that we can learn from them um, through a symposium, which all of you would be invited to, of course. Um, this is Samuele and Andrea. The Samuele on the left is from Levantia. And um, Andrea is from Smarties, and you guys are growing, I believe, some of their varieties um, in your Novi trials. We're growing them down here in our Novik trials, as well as some of the farmers. Here's the group of farmers that went, um, received seed from them, and have them growing all over uh, Oregon and Washington this year. Um, this is just a, a picture of one of the places that we went where they were really into forcing. And so we saw a lot of different forcing chambers where we went. Um, this one was by far the largest. Uh, like I said, I could, this could go on for hours. But <laughs> um, the, and then at the end of our tour, it culminated into, like I said, um, Mirta had her own, um, she organized her own event that was kind of inspired by the events we've been doing here, which is what I hope that you guys in Canada also get inspired and do these there, um, which was called the Jazz which is a dialect word that means ice, um, where she is from in her region. Um, people set up beautiful tables to kind of showcase some of the things that they are growing, um, some traditional things and some new things. Um, here's some of the radicchio um, that they are growing there and some of their brassicas on the left that um, are very interesting and different than what we have here. Um, and I'm almost at the end here. I think an important thing to do also is when we do these events um, and um, try to promote, we, we, we can do that. And we have a, um, you know, we have a, an audience with all of our farmers that we're close with, right? But I think that to try to get the word out to a much larger group, just the general pop population, it's good to include, um, and always invite um, journalists that um, maybe report to and write for food magazines and whatnot. So this is Christy Mucci, who came to the Sagra di Radicchio this past year, and then also went with us to Italy on the um, Radicchio expedition. Um, and she did write this really fantastic um, article that came out in Heated. Um, so I encourage you guys to read that. There's a link on the, if you go to the culinarybreedingnetwork.com website, you can go under press and it's there. It's a really cool article. I think she really did a good job with it. Um, and she did, it was not diluted down into just being something um, silly. <laughs> it actually had some meat to it and I appreciate that. This is one of the quotes that she put in there, which I'll leave you with, which is Jason Salvo at Local Roots Farm that I thought was important because I think during this time and we can start to feel um, or some people can be critical of like, oh, what you're doing is just kind of bougie. What you're doing isn't important. It's actually just like this really pretty vegetable that like is not accessible to everyone, which I don't, I don't agree with because I feel like it really has to do with what Jason's talking about here, where he says it's the broken economic system. That's the heart of what's wrong with the world right now. Radicchio represents a localized economy, low input production and distribution producers selling directly to their consumers. I'm worried about what could happen because our world relies so heavily on exploited labor and a super leveraged global supply chain. When this is all over, I'm sure hope we, I hope we focus our efforts on relocalizing our economies so we can mitigate the major disruptions we will see the next time we get a pandemic or natural disaster. So I think that Radicchio for us in the Pacific Northwest, at least, and, and also in Canada, is that this is something that we can eat here. This is something we can grow and eat here. Uh, and support our local growers. And I think that is what we should do um, always. 
This is uh, just my contact information. Um, you can look at these websites if you want for more information. Um, the Culinary Breeding Network.com, Eat Winter Vegetable Squash, Eat Winter Vegetables. The Chicory Week is also the same as Eat Radicchio. It, we just switched the, there's two URLs now. We've started a new project on garlic. Um, and then also following on Instagram, <clears throat> the Culinary Green Network, and then Chicory Week um, is the Sacro de Radicchio group. And it's also like a week long celebration that we have there that is specific to um, Radicchio. So that is all that I had to say right now. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Lane. We'll just, we'll pass it on to Brian next, who I believe is going to talk about um, seed production. You just, you need to, sorry, Brian, you just have to unmute yourself. Uh, there you go. Great. Well, thanks, David. Um, so uh, my name is Brian and my partner, Christine, and I run Uprising Seeds. Uh, we've been growing uh, Radicchio and Endive for about 15 years now and producing seed for probably going into six or seven season. Um, and David asked me to discuss uh, our process and just some of the um, discovery process of working with chicories as a seed crop. And before I get into that, I thought a good place to start regarding seed work was just some basic botany of this family and some of the historical breeding context of um, radicchios and endives. Um, so when we think about radicchios and endives and escaroles and, and that family of chicories, there's really two species um, to consider. The first is the Chicorian intubus, uh, which is all the radicchio um, types generally, uh, as well as Bel Belgian endive and Punturelle. And then there's Chicorium endivia, which is um, like the curly endives, the frisées and the escaroles. Um, the major, so both are monoecious plants, perfect flowers, um, they have both female and male parts on the same plant and the same flower. Um, but the main differences are the endivias are grown as annuals generally, uh, seed to seed in one season. Radicchios are generally grown as biennials. Um, and the other main difference is that the endivias uh, tend to be uh, very highly self-pollinating. Um, they can be treated almost like lettuce in a field. They need very little isolation. Um, the flowers tend to pollinate before they're open and available to insects, even though they are very attractive to insects. Um, whereas uh, the Intibus, the uh, Radicchio family, tends to be um, much more outcrossing. It's got a really high um, degree of something called sporophytic incompatibility, which is a fancy way of saying a plant won't accept pollen from itself. Um, so it's mandatory outcrossing generally. I think um, like 1% of selfing happens in a, in a natural field situation. So while the two different species can intercross, um, it generally goes one way um, because the endives tend to uh, very much self-pollinate. You don't have to worry about um, other chickories in the field, whereas for radicchios, um, you can get cross-pollination from endives, so they do need to be um, isolated to a pretty high degree. Um, so historically speaking, the cultivation of both goes back to at least the 15th century. Um, and radicchios, generally the majority of that history is open leafy types. Um, when we think of sort of the modern categories of radicchios that come to mind, most of the heading varieties like um, Castle Francos and Veronas and Marisas and um, Piojas. Um, we have these ideas that they are, you know, really rooted in place and culture and have a really long tradition, but they're really just a product of the 20th century is kind of when all that diversity exploded. And the thought is that the first heading type was a Castle Franco that was a result or something approaching a Castle Franco that was an interspecies cross between uh, Treviso tardivo, which is those beautiful elongated tardivo types, and probably um, something in the Indivia family like an Escarole or something like that. And really, in spite of 
you know, all the tradition that seems like is wrapped into these varieties and all this sense of place, it's really only four or five generations of farmers um, that since these, um, this huge diversity and um, all these tra traditions have really evolved. So when we approach the seed work with this, it feels like it's a really exciting time in that we're really just culturally beginning to explore all the potential of all these um, diversity of traits from the, you know, the stem centered chicories like the Punterelle or all the um, leaf colors and patterns and architectures. Um, it seems like there's almost an unlimited potential to recombine traits and create really exciting stuff. Um, so having said that, um, I'm just gonna talk a bit, I don't have slides. Um, our experience at Uprising, we're a pretty small um, specialty seed focused business up in Northwest Washington. Um, we tend to work a lot with uh, traditional varieties that have um, really strong ties to place. Um, for for radicchios, I would say the scale of our growing with them would be considered kind of a stock seed size grow out for, for most places. We tend to deal with small populations um, and do really like a high degree of selection. Um, when we first started working with chicories, I'd say the genetics were really pretty wild and woolly, what was available to us. Um, so there was definitely a sense of needing to rein it in um, and make it more of a commercially viable uh, crop for, for growers and to get people excited about, you know, having a high degree of saleable product for um, the space they were devoting to it. Um, but I feel like in the last several years, the quality of seed that's been coming in, um, especially from some specialty companies um, like the ones that Lane mentioned, as well as uh, TNT in Italy, um, the quality has gone up really quite a bit uh, as to what's available to growers. And um, I would say our scale generally tends to be like in a three to five pound kind of grow out of seed. We have a pretty limited market still, though we're working on that in terms of the enthusiasm for um, for how much we're able to sell as a company. Um, as far as our process goes, uh, we plant and grow our radicchios pretty much identically as you would for um, as a market crop. So we plant, uh, we sow flats generally uh, end of June, beginning of July. Uh, transplant for fall heading. And then our area um, in Northwest Washington, we have very wet winters and we tend to have lows. Um, usually we get a couple spells down in the low to mid teens uh, during the winter. And in our experience, that tends to be a little much to overwinter um, the plants in the field. We've had lots of failures with um, flagging all our um, plants that we would like to do our breeding or, or seed selection with, and then just losing too high a proportion of them to winter kill. Um, and I think uh, the area in the Veneto where they do um, most of the seed production for it, I think it tends to be a little bit warmer and probably a little less um, sort of saturated soils in the winter. So um, whereas for stock seed, they probably don't leave them in the field for the production lots. I suspect that that's mostly overwintered in the field and then um, just naturally let go to seed the following year. Um, so the way we've approached um, the problem with getting them to overwinter is uh, lately we've been flagging plants during the growing season and leaving them as long as we can and prior to a real cold snap or once they start to look um, a little ragged in the winter, we'll dig them up and pop them up into um, gallon pots and bring them into heat tables um, at our house in Bellingham to where um, we can overwinter them and in the coldest weather um, grow on the heat. Generally trim them back so that there's not a lot of vegetative um, material to uh, encourage rot because crown rot can be a problem. Um, and then, so we will generally keep them in there until um, March or early April. And by that time, we're generally able to get into the fields and uh, we'll plant them back out. Uh, generally, we see flowering in July and seed harvest um, in just a couple weeks from now. 
So with radicchios and chicories in general, um, the flowers and seed tends to mature over a long period. So it tends to be the type of crop where you need to um, pick your moment where you have kind of a critical threshold of mature seed on the plants. Um, generally, we found the birds will let you know um, when your seed is ready because they are really attracted to it and it can be problematic. Um, so we try to find that balance of mature seed um, and you know a minimal amount of shattering or, or the plants shedding their seed before we get to it. Um, we cut the whole plants. Um, we generally swap them on tarps out in the field. And for threshing, we found um, since the uh, seeds are held really tightly, they can be um, difficult to thresh out of the plant. And the tool we found by far to be the most effective is a chipper shredder um, and not a wood chipper with sharp blades like you might think, but um, more like a um, straw and uh, leaf shredder that's got blunted blades. Um, basically kind of bludgeoning the plants with a blunt blade um, that, that frees up the seed and then uh, a really uh, strong wind that will stream uh, generally gets us a, a pretty high quality seed. So um, we've started, as we've started to see such a high um, quality of seed for a lot of the major crops um, become available through, through import from these companies in, in Italy that are starting to release really high quality things. We've been more focusing on um, breeding lines and doing some novel crosses, um, combining traits. Uh, so we're dealing with a lot of small populations. And one thing that that requires is um, getting creative with isolations. So um, for people who are interested in starting um, to breed and explore the potential of these. We've uh, started using isolation tents quite a bit, um, where it's a completely netted structure uh, to exclude insects. And then we uh, introduce pollinators, uh, generally the ones that work best for us with chicories are leaf cutter bees, which are very active um, during the time of year that uh, flowering happens in that family. Um, so in that way, we're able to do a production lot in the field and at the same time have two or three uh, additional small breeding populations in a tent all in the same field that, that we can um, produce at the same time. Um, a lot of what we're interested to in these days and kind of obsess about is uh, the forcing varieties. And I think if there's an ambassador for the family um, that is just kind of universally um, appealing to people. Uh, so many of the forest varieties are just so stunningly beautiful and um, really nothing like anybody's seen in terms of salad greens um, generally in this country. So the Gorizia types that have these beautiful rose-like structures or the Tardivo types, which are these beautiful elongated heads. Um, so we're exploring a lot of um, different coloring and patterning in those varieties and hoping to release eventually some new combinations of, of, of traits in that category. Um, that's really all I had prepared. I know um, we'll move to Quebec where it's probably even more challenging. I would say as far as um, climatically uh, where we are in the country is probably one of the most similar um, climates to uh, the Ridiculous homeland in the Veneto. So um, it's a really great place for um, us to be working with them up here in the Northwest. And uh, the beauty of it is um, the long kind of cool progression from fall to winter. Um, as frost we find really enhances a lot of the qualities of these and places with a much harsher transition from fall weather to you know, very deep freezes or, or snow, I think can be more challenging, but it's probably a good time to Move to Dan and talk, talk about some of those challenges. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Brian. <clears throat> That's great. Yeah, Dan, are you able to share your screen? I am. Everybody hears me? We can hear you, yeah. Great. So, 
I'm going to talk about growing radicchio seed, and I thought I would really emphasize that we're growing within Montreal winters, so a little bit colder and maybe snowier than what Brian is talking about, though I think you're maybe more cold and snowier than, I don't know about snowy, but colder than some other places. Um, so, uh, how do I do this? I got to learn how to change slides on this. Indeed. There we are. Yeah. So, <laughs> thanks, Lane. Um, so, I'm part of Turner Soul Cooperative Farm. We are seven people who run a worker co op, and then we also have an additional seven or eight staff, so a total of 15 or 14 or 15 of us. And uh, we're predominantly vegetable growers. Um, we run a, well, we are vegetable growers. Um, we run a 500 member weekly CSA, and this is what it looks like most years, though this year it looks more like this. And um, we also have a seed company and, um, and we grow seed and sell seed. And um, this is where our farm is. Um, so we're west of Montreal, about 45 minutes west of Montreal. And our winters are very cold. So the peak of it is about minus 20 Celsius to minus 35 Celsius. So that's minus five Fahrenheit to minus 30 Fahrenheit. Kind of, and so we get that range up and down, up and down throughout the winter. Um, and uh, this is an addition to a lot of snow. And so this definitely has colored the way that we've uh, had experience with radicchio. And one thing too, just like our summers can be somewhat variable. They tend to be either very, well, hot for us. Uh, so that's probably around 30 to 35 C, which is kind of like, you know, a mid eighties to mid nineties Fahrenheit. Um, go and most years are like that. And then some years we'll have years that doesn't get the 30 C. And so one we find thing we found is the summer temperature really makes a difference on the fall success that how quick things grow. So that, that's, that's the context of where we're growing. And so I'm just going to run through sort of my experience with radicchio, which has really been a lot about the diversity of radicchio varieties and trialing and then selecting radicchio plants that we're gonna let proceed and then overwintering radicchio plants. And listening to Brian, I think I'm about like three years behind where he is. <laughs> so maybe so you could say, like a lot of what you've explained really resound, resonates to me as things I'm learning and feel like you're, you're kind of in the next steps of where we're, we're going. So I'll start off with, uh, with more trialing and um, so in 2014, we went to the, uh, the Organic Seed Alliance Conference um, in Corvallis, and I, uh, and I believe I saw you, Lane, maybe um, presenting at Gathering, I think Gathering Together Farm, and just a bunch of different... ...for that in chicories, but I hadn't really seen what was potential until that point. And so that we came home and we just got a lot of different radicchio seed from companies all over, a lot from the West Coast. And then that fall, we grew a bunch out. And this is a partial of part of the field. And we just grew a bunch. And, um, uh, and now, and I just assumed, so my first assumption was that our climate was very different than the West Coast. And that's why we saw so much diversity. But listening to Brian talk, I wonder if maybe some of the varieties just weren't as refined as they could be. And also one thing I learned later by talking to people that I think we were growing some forcing varieties, but didn't know what they were, tardivos and grumolos. And so just weren't that satisfied with the head because there was nothing and we didn't know the next steps. Um, so that was the first thing is we did a, grew a lot of different stuff to see what we liked. And um, so here's a diversity of, I'm not even sure what variety this was, but it's something that we grew and you can see. So this is a variety and I, like there's six plants, there's two that look like they might be the same thing and everything else is different. One doesn't have a head. And this is a lot of the experience that we had with different varieties. Um, and then we also had winter came and we noticed that there were some that, that took the cold and were able to go down to minus 10 Celsius um, without, without a problem. So that's kind of like be 10, 15 Fahrenheit. And then some didn't, and this was very sudden colds. Um, and some didn't do it as well. And we've also seen this even in recent years, like last November, we, we'd had the temperature drop down to probably about minus 16 or minus 20 Celsius. And then when it thawed out, we had sugar loaves and a few varieties that were still fine, but then others, others weren't. So we saw a broad, broad diversity of those. And based on what was forming heads and was able to take um, cold, that's kind of what we selected. And there wasn't a lot of stuff that came out of that. Like we had, I don't know, 10 or 15 varieties um, that first year. And there was probably only three or four varieties we kept trialing for the next couple of years. 
And this brought us into selection. So um, we started to, so this is, um, so one of the varieties that we really liked was uh, the early Treviso from Wild Garden Seed. And so here is uh, a bunch of those. And um, so this is at one point in the fall, I'm guessing end of October, beginning November, we kind of started to do selection. And so what we were finding was that about, for this specific, uh, this, this is the radicchio that we had, or the, the chicory that we had the most heads coming out of it. And it was probably about a 70% pack out rate we get from that. Whereas many of the others were like 20 to 40%, unless we were getting hybrids, um, with the hybrids had a really high pack out rate. And so the first thing we do is kind of like push the leaves down to see the heads and kind of do that across the board. And um, so you can see there's some, some nice heads. And then we'd start to select in that. And so we're looking, so this one might, I'm not sure from the picture, but it looks like it might even start to be bolting a little bit. And if that was the case, I wouldn't take this one. Uh, but if it wasn't bolting, I would take it. You know, it's a nice color and it's nice and firm. And then we had some that had a lot more green or pinkishness. And as long as they have a nice head, I'll keep them. Um, but then we have some stuff that has great colors that has no head. So this definitely eliminate from the population. And yeah, so some stuff that was quite nice. And um, I think I'm going in a circles here. And then we dug out the, uh, the roots um, and we've tried different things. So in some cases, oh, I thought I had another picture of this. In some cases we've kind of just chopped the top of the roots off, uh, the, 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 not the roots, the, the head. In some cases we've actually tried to chop the whole head but like leave a few, maybe an inch of growing on the bottom. And I don't really have something I recommend specifically but we'd bring the, the plants in like this um, into bins. And in an ideal world, we would actually harvest from the field into pots right away. But it feels that usually at that time, we're just feeling crazy. So we just throw them into bins, make sure they're labeled and toss them in the cold room. And then we deal with them in January. Um, and um, maybe this year will be different. Um, so then we overwinter the radicchio plants. And so, we put them into pots. So this is actually, this is kind of an Italian dandelion. Um, and uh, we put them into pots. We bring them into our cold room. And our cold room is about four degrees Celsius through the winter. And um, uh, so it's just, you know, it's dark. Um, and so it's where we have our beets and carrots and other storage crops. And uh, these are some of the trevizos that are starting to, to, to grow inside in cold storage. Um, morph those dandelions. And then we bring them outdoors. And, um, and this is something we're still figuring out the best timing because um, it's, it's quite cold and sometimes very snowy until early to mid April. And so we can't get anything into the field until early May, but things start to sort of rotting in the, uh, in the cold room at the, at, around this transition point. So we tend to try to bring stuff into the, the greenhouse at that point and um, let them start to catch and uh, start to grow again. Uh, so here's a, a, a Lucia. I think this is, a, this is an early Lucia that we also may have gotten from Wild Garden Seed that had uh, a lot of these were not as hardy and forming heads, but there was one strain that we did that was had success, so we started to work on that. And so we're bringing out, so this is some of the, the, the population. And we haven't, ha we don't, like, I would love to be saving seed from hundreds of plants. I think we're saving seeds from about 30 or 40 plants per variety right now. Um, and um, in some cases, we're growing them out like this and then planting them into the field and then saving seed. And in other cases, because of isolation also, we've been growing them out in pots like this in greenhouses or, uh, or hardening off tunnels. And, um, and this is a place that we've had a sensitive time. We can get a lot of plants to this point, And then right here is where I suddenly feel that we'll hit a, have a bunch that will suddenly just disintegrate on us, just kind of m like melt on us, uh, rot. And um, so that's, that's just kind of where the bottleneck or the weak link is that we're addressing right now in our production. And um, we're still at the point where I think, like we haven't released any of the stuff that we're working on. We're just growing it out, selecting. Um, uh, but so here's some of, and I'll talk more about that in an instant. So here's what some of those will look like as they're about to bolt. This is uh, some of the dandelions. So you can see there's still a lot of diversity in there. And some of the diversity looks different when it's bolting than when it's in the field. We may have thought it was fairly uniform in the field and then when it starts to bolt, it looks a lot more diverse. 
Um, here are some going up to seed and going to seed again. And then, so just to talk a little bit about timing. So um, this is kind of, so we treat radicchio as a biennial. So around mid-June, we seed radicchio in seedling cells in the greenhouse. And then mid-July, we plant in the field. We also have done some planting with August, for August 1st, but um, if, there's any, if, if it's a hot summer, like, well, actually that's the opposite. If it's a cold summer, August 1st plantings are a little bit too late. Whereas if it's a hot summer, then the July 15th plantings come in early, but we get them, but they come in before the frosts. And then around October 25th to early November is when we're going to harvest the, the roots, or not the root, we'll be harvesting the heads normally. And this is also when we'd select to overwinter plants. And then so we bring them for the winter, they're in a cold room in the winter, and then around April 10th or so, we'll move them to a greenhouse where they'll be just sitting in their pots. And then around May 1st, we plant them in the field or let them go to seed in the greenhouse if that's where they're gonna be. And then sometime in mid-August, we'd be harvesting the seed. And um, this is the seed I like to harvest the least. It really it doesn't, doesn't shatter easily. Uh, we have more of a wood chipper rather than a um, straw shredder. So that might be the challenge. I've also been, you know, I, I, I was taught also by somebody to put them in a wheelbarrow and then take a rake and then just whack them a lot. And so we've done a little bit of that, but this is definitely one of the challenges we have. So this is a year to get the, uh, or more than a year to get the radicchio seed. Now, the challenge is we wanna plant the next one in mid-June. So some crops like winter radish, we're able to seed now and then harvest in September over winter, get seed and then manage to kind of force the seed so we can get it at the end of July and then reseed again now and almost growing it on an annual cycle. But with the radicchios, we haven't been able to do that. So we're always, it's like two years to really get to see the next stuff. So the stuff I'm growing out right now is gonna be the stuff from two years ago. And so it's a long, they're long steps. So I'm both learning how to overwinter the stuff in addition to select. And it's just a delay to kind of see how the results we're having. So yeah, so this year would be the second year where we're able to, to grow the seed and then kind of staggered. So right now we're on a cycle where one year we're selecting sugar loaf and one year we're selecting treviso. And um, uh, this year we're harvesting the sugar loaf seed. I'm very excited to see that next year. And this year we're growing out the treviso that we harvested last year. So, um, so this is kind of the, the, the timing that, that, we've, that we've been worked out. And it, it's, it works pretty good, I guess. <laughs> this is sort of what we're living. So just to kind of, I mean, I've, I've sort of run through this um, maybe quickly, but um, kind of we started off by trialing a bunch of varieties and then selecting the varieties we liked and then the heads within those populations that we liked. And we've been kind of doing it on a staggered sequence. Um, and then we overwinter the planet plants. And this is one of the places where we definitely have to learn more. And um, it might just be figuring out ways to have not too much vegetative material. Um, Brian mentioned uh, crown rot, and I, I relate to that. <laughs> Don't like it, but relate to it. Um, and so that's, that's where we get to. Um, I thought I would just throw in that I do have a four-part seed saving course that I put together last fall that I'm about to put back online. And uh, so there's an address there if anybody's interested. If you do go to this right now, you won't find the course. It should be up in the next week or two, but you'll get it an e onto the email list where you can be notified. And thanks for walking, for, walking through this with me. Um, yeah, and going to seed.net is actually where I write about seed and farming and spreadsheets, which are important in farming too. And um, so if you wanna read more of that stuff, that's there. So thank you so much. Okay, <clears throat> thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Dan and uh, and Brian. Um, and Lane does need to leave in a few minutes, and we were going to have a question period right now. So, uh, what I'll suggest is, if anybody has a question for Lane right now, let's ask it. But then maybe we'll move into the next two presentations and just do all the questions at the end, um, if that's okay. So you're welcome to. Um, Unmute yourself and ask a question if you have any or type it into the chat box. 
um, for Lane. She's also said she'd be happy to have people get in touch with her later if they have questions. Yeah, I'm sorry that I double booked myself. Um, it's the other Novik meeting. <laughs> so, um, and this is really interesting and I hope to, um, I, I will watch the recording. I'm sorry to miss it, but um, yeah, I would like to keep in touch with you guys. I'll take questions for sure. But I would also, I, one thing I didn't say is we're starting a Pacific Northwest Radicchio Association and we'll be inviting um, all of you guys to be part of that as well to talk about marketing, envisioning, um, you know, um, Radicchio, which will and also be a symposium once a year that will be discussing all these things that you guys are discussing today and getting together the experts that have this information that we can all share and learn together. Okay. Uh, there's a question. Um, there's a question. Uh, what was what has the customer response to the bitterness been? Um, you know, I think that we're swaying people. Honestly, I mean, I, um, I think that we do probably um, have people that are already a big fan of this. To, that are gathering together. I didn't say that. Like the radicchio, um, the Sagra de radicchio is usually about 325 people because that's all that we can fit, but we could have more. Um, I think that we are communicating really great ways within conjunction with our chefs and how to prepare radicchio, you know, from soaking to like how you, like if you're going to use it raw in a salad, what you pair it with, how you cook it and giving them a lot of information like that. Um, so that people are starting to appreciate that bitterness. I will also say that this year will be challenging since we don't have a lot of chefs to partner with because it has been the restaurants and the chefs that have been really pushing this forward. So if someone will go into a restaurant and eat a radicchio salad or something else and be really excited about it and then try to cook something themselves. So it's, it's um, a challenge for us this year, but we're ready to take it on to try to get people, um, there's consumers buying it directly. Um, we have some ideas on um, radicchio boxes, kind of like a CSA style model where we'll be getting, uh, getting people to sign up for, um, to sign up for getting like a CSA, but like every week or every other week, radicchio, we'll give them a recipe. We're going to have those farms, we'll partner with um, like other um, small independently owned businesses that all have things that pair nicely, like cheeses and anchovies and breadcrumbs and these things that they would sell all together. So like a kit to try to really get people like empowered because I think that's what it is at the end of the day, even when we're working with all of our chefs that, and we, we want them to be using it at the end of the day, we want people to be cooking these things and using them in their home. So um, I think people are coming around to it, honestly, you know, I think it's exciting for them. And again, the pink, it really gets them, it gets them wanting to try it. <laughs> and it's more mild, you know, but it gets, it really does get people wanting to eat this beautiful thing. So I think the more beautiful ones uh, and the speckled ones and the ones that, you know, Linda and I were talking yesterday, the gateways, like the Casa Franco and like to gently get them into, before they go into like uh, Treviso Percoche or Chioggia's or something like that, then it's something that I think that people are kind of getting excited about. Great. Thanks a lot. Thank um, th thanks so much for joining, Lane. I'll, yeah, uh, meeting you. I'll... I'll let you go. Okay. And yeah, so I think we'll move on to um, uh, Alex and Linda next. So however you want to present. Um, I can go if that's okay. Sure, go ahead. Okay. Um, so I'm Linda with Osborne Sea Company in Mount Vernon, Washington. So let me share my screen. Can everybody see it? Can you guys see my screen now? Yeah, we're all, all good, Linda. Okay. Um, so we are a seed company that's been around since the 80s um, and we sell vegetable, herb, and flower seeds all across the U.S. and Canada. Um, and we have, there's always been people uh, that work at Osborne that have been really passionate about radicchio um, throughout the years. So we've had a pretty 
wide selection of radicchio um, in our catalog for the last 10 to 15 years. Um, and we continue to work on our radicchio lineup um, as there's growing interest now. Um, so this is a photo from our trial field and that's actually our uh, 2019 catalog cover is that radicchio display. So it just shows a nice array of all of the different types. Um, Some reason it's not advancing my slide. There we go. Um, so I put together just like a kind of basic best practices for radicchio, just because I wasn't sure where everyone's skill level is. But um, in general, radicchio is a slotted ver slotted crop, so meaning there's different types that do well in different growing seasons. So. Uh, there's early, mid, and late season production. Uh, and we put together in our catalog a nice chart last year that um, says which growing season it's suited best for. So in general, that's spring, summer, or fall, and into winter. Um, the earlier days to maturity ones are for early and mid season growing and warmer temperatures. So they're generally a little more bolt tolerant. Um, and then the with less cold tolerance. Um, but radicchio grown in warmer temperatures are is just going to be a little more bitter because it is more of a cool season crop. Um, and then the longer days to maturity ones are going to be for later production. Um, for colder freezing temperatures and they're going to have a bigger frame on the plant so they're going to be more cold and frost tolerant. Um, the late season radicchio with the longer days to maturity just need to be planted early enough to put on the growth before the, the temperatures go down. So sometimes uh, if, if radicchio is planted too late the heads won't fully form. Um, and if too early, the heads will crack or bolt potentially. Uh, and another thing that a lot of people don't realize is that radicchio is kind of like cabbage where it will continue to take up water and sunlight and grow even after it's mature. So to get the best quality, um, it's, it's recommended to um, to store, harvest and store when it's at optimum size rather than field holding it, especially if you're in colder climates um, and that, you know, the cold below 20 degree temperatures or Fahrenheit are gonna be, um, gonna affect your uh, crop yield. Um, and then you just want to identify types that you desire to grow. So if you want to do the pink ones or Casal Franco or the more traditional Kyojas, just looking at um, the varieties and then the timing that you want to grow them in and make sure that you choose the right ones. Um, so radicchio growing in the Northwest, uh, like every, most other people mentioned, this is the ideal growing season or growing region for radicchio. And it's most similar in climate and latitude to the growing regions of Italy. So that's why in the Pacific Northwest of the US and Canada, we're in such a prime location for it and it's much easier to grow here. Um, so we have the cooler temperatures and the winters are more mild and the later maturing ones can tolerate um, cold and freezing temperatures, but below 20 degrees Fahrenheit or negative six Celsius, it gets into the um, too cold where radicchio is going to have some damage or some um, less yields. Uh, and you can grow um, the full slot of varieties in the Northwest from the earliest to the latest ones. Um, again, because we're most similar to the regions that these are traditionally grown in. Um, and this is a photo of the Costa Rosa, which is a, a kind of specialty Verona type. Um, 
it has the beautiful purple stems and a little bit wider of veins and it's a really nice one that we now carry. Um, and here's the famous pinks. Uh, this is the one that we stocked, the Rosalba type. So this has been a very popular one of ours um, that we brought in a couple of years ago and it has a mild flavor and it matures really late. So it's nice for people that are trying to push their season a little later and having stuff. Um, in our region, it generally as a summer solstice seeded and transplanted in July. Um, it matures around December and it needs the cold freezing temperatures, you know, around freezing points to turn pink. Um, so it'll be kind of a light green for most of its mature, until it's fully mature and then it'll start turning pink and it's a really beautiful crop. So for the Midwest and East, it's a little bit different. Um, obviously it's more challenging due to earlier frost and lower winter temperatures. Um, varieties with days to maturity below 100 are, days are gonna be the better ones for uh, that growing climate. Um, the, so some of those varieties that we have is Baldo, which is this one. Um, in the photo, which is a Treviso type, and then 614. Um, and again, storing might be a better approach rather than doing the later maturing ones. So if you do kind of the 90 days, then that gets you to harvest before the cold, hard frost potentially are. And then you can store it them in micro bin, macro bins or um, in any sort of uh, storage um, in your cooler and then you can just pack out of the cooler. There will be some leaf deterioration on the outside but they peel back really nice um, and if they're picked at the right time with the with not very much moisture like if you pick it on a dry day um, at their optimal uh, size then they can store for a uh, three to five months and sometimes longer if they're stored correctly. Um, forcing is another option for, for the East Coast and colder climates. Um, like you can force Rosalba even, um, even though it's not a traditional forcing type, but that is another option so that you dig them out of the field and force them indoors uh, and you can get a crop on some of those later ones. So basically a, a kind of general thing to think about is just that you want things out of the field before it gets too cold, which is like 20 to, or negative six Celsius. So at Osborne, um, like I mentioned, we do our trials. Um, we are a seed company that we don't breed our own seeds, but we work with the breeder companies to trial different seeds. Um, and varieties. So every year we try to trial basically new material or, or varieties from new companies that we haven't worked with before against our current lineup and see if there's improvements. Um, and those improvements that we're looking for are, are improved uniformity, um, higher marketability of harvests, like higher yields, um, and still with the traditional flavors. Um, a lot of people have been looking here in the Northwest for later maturing varieties and more. Um, so we're always looking to see which ones hold up best late into the winter. Um, and then we're also, as I mentioned, selling to uh, farmers and growers all across the country and all over Canada. So we're looking for adaptive ones that can be used in multiple regions. Um, so we have some new varieties from vendors like Levantia, which Lane had mentioned, and those varieties we brought in this past year. Um, and we're working with a few other new companies as well. And we basically try to offer a couple of different slottings for each type. So in our catalog right now, we have the Lucia types, we have um, Casa Franco, lots of Treviso and Chioggia, and then some of the specialty ones as well. 
so we've been really happy with some of the new varieties from Bijo, like Leonardo and Rubro that are hybrids. So they are um, higher or they have more consistency of heading up and they can be easier to grow, especially if you're beginning because they're not quite as finicky as some of the other varieties. Um, and we'll keep trialing them against what we have to make sure that um, it's at better than what we currently stock. Um, and then we're always looking at specialty types as well. Like we're excited about the Costa Rosa one that has those purple stems. And we also work with farmers in different regions. So we have a, a one acre or a two acre trial farm here in Mount Vernon that we do our variety trials at and then we work with different farmers in other regions. So we help the Novik farmers order their seed, um, a lot of their trial seed this year. Um, and we also work with uh, different farmers that are um, growing radicchio to see what works best for them. Um, and we also just recommend because radicchio is so um, climate sensitive in a lot of ways that uh, farmers, if they haven't started growing radicchio or are curious about it to, um, to grow out their own radicchio trials and just do a couple different planting dates and a few different um, varieties so that you can kind of see what works best for your area and microclimate. So here's, um, this is just a little on the left, that's just a little a uh, shot of some of the radicchio we grew at our trial last year. And then on the right is uh, the variety trials at TNT, which is one of the radicchio breeding companies that we work with. Um, and that was in Italy in 2018. Um, I was able to go out there and visit their trials. And they have a research station up in Kyoto, which is the traditional northern area that radicchio is grown. And then they also have a research station down uh, like an hour south of Rome, which is a much different climate. It's much warmer and it's more southern latitudes. So it was really interesting to see the radicchio grown out in that. Um, different of a climate um, and they're working on a lot of breeding with some hybrid varieties that they're seeing how they did against their OP lines in that uh, warmer region. Um, and then just for further information, uh, I've worked a lot on getting some more educational materials out through Osborne on Radicchio. So this is a picture of a pamphlet that I put together um, that just has basic growing information and kind of best practices like what I went over today. Uh, we also have a, that table in our catalog that kind of goes through how to best select the varieties and, and a little bit more information about dacy maturity and the slotting. Um, TNT and Levantia both have really good information in their catalogs online that is available in English as well as Italian. So uh, that would be a good place to go, especially for latitude information. Um, they have kind of uh, variety recommendations based on latitude. And then Culinary Breeding Network has put together their radicchio zine, which has a really nice overview of the types and kind of the history. And that's my contact information if you ever have specific questions. Um, and then we also have an Instagram account, Osborne Quality Seeds, that you can look at for, we post our new varieties and trial updates on there. Um, and then we also do a lot of email um, kind of updates too about our uh, lineup. So that is, um, that's my presentation. So let me stop my screen share. Hey, great. Thanks, Linda. Yeah. Alex, I think you're muted. Um. All right, there we go. Thanks, Linda. Um, let me share my screen.
Okay, can everyone see it? And let me go to presenter mode here. There we go. Can everyone see my screen all right? Okay. Yeah, okay, good. great. Um, so thank you everyone. And it's been really great to listen to all of the previous presentations and get the whole picture of the world of radicchio right now. So I'm Dr. Alex Lyon. I, for the last five years, have been a postdoctoral fellow at the University of British Columbia Center for Sustainable Food Systems. And in that position, um, helped to um, start the Kenobi project, which includes variety trials and participatory plant breeding across Canada in collaboration with the Bauta Family Initiative on Canadian Seed Security and Farm Folk City Folk. And as of about a month ago, I have changed positions and I'm now a faculty member in sustainable agriculture and food systems at Kwantlen Polytechnic University. So that's still right here in the lower mainland in BC. And I'm gonna you know, be continuing in various capacities to collaborate with this community, but um, I am changing positions in that way. So anyway, I, it's, it's nice to have this opportunity to revisit Radicchio and these projects that we got started earlier this spring, which I'm still quite excited about. Um, so to give people a background on, on what we're doing with Radicchio in the Kenobi project, I won't go into too much detail about Kenobi, but I'm happy to do follow up questions about it if, if anybody has questions about the other crops that we're trialing. But we decided to trial radicchio this year, partly because of all of the excitement that we had heard from growers in the Pacific Northwest and the things that Lane has been doing and the work that Osborne's been doing with radicchio in that region. Um, that inspired farmers in British Columbia to organize and to organize an event around radicchio last year. Uh, so that when we were planning new crops to put into our Kenobi trial network for 2020, we decided on radicchio. And I really had no idea how many people would be interested in working on this crop. As it turned out, we had 44 farms sign up across the country, which was way more than we were expecting. Um, and it's really great to see that excitement. So a map of our farm sites this year you can see most of them are clustered in BC, uh, Ontario, and Quebec, but we do have them scattered really all over. So hopefully this provides um, quite a lot of new information about how these varieties grow uh, this far north and in this many different climates. And this year in 2020 is definitely um, kind of a pilot and some, uh, a time when we're expecting to learn a lot through trial and error especially around these things that Linda talked about, about slotting and when to plant and um, when to harvest and how, how different types of radicchio do in different climates. And in the Kenobi trials, uh, the way they work, farmers sign up for the trials, we send them seeds, uh, we, we select varieties kind of as a research team um, in collaboration with the regional coordinators that work um, work with farmers throughout this network. Uh, we use information that farmers are telling us and that we've gathered ourselves through talking to people like Linda about what varieties would be good to include in trials. And um, I'll get into what we've selected for radicchio, but I just wanted to mention the way that farmers do the trials. They, send, they get sent the seed and instructions, they plant the seed, and then we're using a platform called Seedlinked, which they can use online on their computers or on phones to enter ratings of the varieties. And the results for these will be available through Seedlinked to the farmers that participated, and then we'll also make them available to the broader public through our websites, the, a couple of different websites that are associated with the project. So this is the Vancouver Radicchio Festival that started last year in 2019. Uh, really organized largely or initiated really by Chris Bodner from Close to Home Organics. And uh, Chris reached out to me last year to see if I could just come talk about participatory plant breeding at the Radicchio Festival. And then through that, we got inspired to work more on Radicchio as a group with Kenobi. Um, so if you are looking for information about Radicchio in Canada, and especially if you're looking for marketing materials and recipes, I'd really encourage you to go to their website. They did some amazing 
uh, photography and graphics, and it's a great place to, to find information to help but kind of with those consumer questions about radicchio and how to use it in different types. So um, based on talking to Linda and talking to growers, we chose four types of radicchio for the trials this year, and those are Chioja, I'll go through each of them, but Chioja, Castelfranco, Lucia, and Treviso. And we chose all of these based on the advice that we got from plant breeders that these are the easier market categories to grow and also kind of good entry level radicchios for customers that are um, on the less bitter side, but also have that attractive appeal that Lane was talking about. Um, so Kyoja is probably the type that people are most familiar with in the grocery store. It's got that round tight um, head that's sort of a purplish red. These are just a couple of examples of varieties. One that's a little bit unique that we included is Julieta, which is almost like a combination between Gioja and like a Treviso with that wide midrib. And then Castelfranco, which is a sort of a looser, more lettuce shaped head, but has these beautiful speckles and is also uh, fairly mild in bitterness. Lucia, which also has those speckles, but is more of a tight head. And Treviso, which is that oblong shape with a um, really like a nice juicy midrib um, that's better for cooking. Um, but also I've, I've had it prepared like as a little boat. You can kind of put little fillings on a leaf because they're a very nice shape. So I wanted to just show you our variety list. Where there are so many different types of radicchio and so many different varieties that um, it was hard to narrow it down, but we decided to go ahead and include a lot of varieties and have growers just choose what they wanna grow. They're not all growing all of these varieties, um, but they were able to select which ones they were interested in. Uh, and to help you make sense of this list, basically there's the four categories, but then within each of those, we tried to, tried to include a range of uh, varieties with different days to maturity, knowing that we have some growers in British Columbia who are interested in something for a long season and maybe even experimenting with how long they can leave radicchio in the fields with a very long season variety. And then we have um, you know, folks in Ontario and Quebec who need something with a shorter days to maturity um, and to be able to harvest that before a really hard freeze. So those are, those are what we're working with. Um, I don't have a lot more to present about it. I just wanted to show you what we're doing. And we, people have transplanted into the field now and we'll be getting results in the fall as these varieties mature. So I'm curious to hear any comments or questions that people have that are probably more familiar with radicchio than me about these varieties and um, what success they had with any of them and um, what they think are important questions to ask in the future. So I'll just wrap it up there and, and open it up to questions. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Alex. We, uh, we went a little over time on presentations, so we don't have a lot of time for questions before 1230. Um, there was one brief one uh, somebody put in the chat wondering about forcing, uh, and I responded saying it's the process of pulling roots before the winter, I believe without the tops, and then growing it out in a greenhouse or indoors. Um, is that correct? Is everybody else's? Yeah. Generally, if you're forcing it for, um, for the vegetable, there are like varying degrees of how much you cut down the root. So yeah, there's some good Italian videos and resources on it because there's not a ton of people doing it here in the US quite yet. But. I actually wondered if Brian could talk about how he cuts down the root or how he forces. Yeah, sure. Um, so we generally um, pull plants and kind of shake them out, shake the dirt off. Um, depending on what it is uh, for something like Belgian endive, it has a really long, almost like parsnip-like taproot. 
and we'll cut those all the way back, um, being careful not to nick the apical meristem. And then they grow basically from the stump. Um, the other types, and that has to be done in, in darkness, uh, the second phase, so that it gets that uh, beautiful kind of golden chlorophyll free um, color to it. Um, the other ones we work with are the Gorizia types, which um, look like kind of a big unruly thing in the field. And then as it gets colder and colder, the, the center growth gets denser and denser. Um, and then we bring those in also to darkness. And we don't generally trim those back at all. Maybe we'll pull out the outer leaves just so they're not so big anymore. Um, and then they force and make kind of a beautiful rose form um, that you can look up. They're really stunning. And then the third one uh, is uh, Treviso tardivo, which are those beautiful squid looking elongated uh, red leaves with the right ribs. And those ones we found they actually don't require darkness. A lot of growers do force them in darkness, um, but we find that they will either um, make that form in the field if left long enough and if you have a mild enough climate, but generally the tenderest, um, from a culinary perspective, probably superior um, product. Um, those are brought in, again, shaking off the roots, but leaving the leaves and then um, generally the way those are done in Italy is they're put in wire crates packed pretty densely together and then um, they're dipped so that basically just the root portion of it is in kind of a circulating water bath um, and like most biennials like all the energy of the plant is, is sustained in the root so they really don't need any nutrients enforcing you're just kind of providing a medium of moisture um, just so you get that um, center growth. And we find that those work fine in light or, or without light, they're, they're less fussy in that regard. Um, but one of the things you get from forcing and one of the desired characteristics is that in kind of a coddled environment uh, where they're not producing chlorophyll, where they're not exposed to any real like hardship of weather, um, the leaf quality you get is just extremely tender, much less bitter, uh, much more of like a fresh salad type green um, than something that, um, you know, is producing those bitter components as a result of, you know, being out in the field and the cold and wind and whatnot. So that's kind of, that's the goal. In addition to just the beauty of the form is just a really tender, tender leaf. Great. There's just a <clears throat> couple more questions. One was how do you evaluate at harvest time when var varieties have different days to maturity? So for the early ones. I guess it's just a question of harvesting. Somebody want to speak to that? I'm guessing we're... Um, yeah, I can speak to what I would um, advise for the Kenobi trials, but Linda, if you have thoughts about that, I'd be really interested to hear. Like for us, I would just recommend people harvest them when they're at their correct days to maturity or when they look like they're ready to be harvested. Not So yeah, you're not going to be able to harvest everything at once. You should harvest each variety when it's mature and then do the rating for that variety um, based on what it looks like when you harvest it. Yeah, we generally, even for other trials, there's always a little bit of just, you know, some varieties are faster than others. So um, yeah, generally you just kind of watch when you know they should be getting ready and then evaluate as they come to maturity. Okay, <clears throat> there's one more question. I, I, I was oh. just going to add squeezing them, like just squeezing them. And if it feels like it's like with a cabbage, you know, sometimes you have when you hold a cabbage, it's nice and dense. And sometimes you can tell that it hasn't finished forming. So like there's a, there's a certain part when you squeeze a nice uh, radicchio, you, it feels great. So. Yeah. And also if you cut some that are, are formed open and you see what the core length is, then you can tell like is the core length elongating and it's starting to go starting to get over and bolt or is it still really tiny and a little loose inside and it might not be ready yet great um there's one more question about storage uh what are the best storage conditions for in storage holding do you water them uh or do you just keep it cool and leave it alone 
Um, for just storing, you, you don't water. That would only be for forcing. Um, a lot of people will store in like macro bins, big perforated plastic bins with like loosely put plastic over it because you don't like you do with cabbage you don't want no air circulation but you don't want um, enough air exposure that they'll wilt um, so yeah either in like a big plastic bags with a little bit of plastic on top so there's still some ventilation or or macro bins with some plastic okay great um, one if more the question if the question was meant for seed production just like we're not forcing ours, though they kind of force a bit. And we just have, we put them in peat moss mostly, and we just get them moist enough to keep the roots from drying out. But we water once or twice in the winter at most. But they're being kept kept in a cold room. Great. Um, <clears throat> okay, maybe last question. There's, uh, are there techniques that make overwintering the field more successful? I think just choosing the right varieties and then uh, playing around with planting dates to see when you get the most um, heads that are harvestable. I was, I was just going to say the same thing. I think um, if, if you're looking for like winter production, that's specifically going to be like December and later. Um, I'd say like the Grimolos are designed to be kind of late winter harvested. Um, Castle Francos do pretty well into the winter. The, the pink chicories, the Rosalbas and those types um, do very well into the winter as do uh, sugar loaves. I seem to be the categories that I would think of as being sort of the most full column. Great, and then getting the right winter, I suppose. <laughs> um, Great, I think that brings us to the end of the questions and the webinar, we're just a few minutes over. Um, and I thank everybody who's uh, taken part in, in joining and putting this together as well as uh, attending and listening. I will send out um, an email to everybody with uh, some links to more information. We have a full cooking video and a farm tour and some radicchio fact sheets. Um, so thanks again, everybody for joining. Thank you. All right. Thanks, David. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot, everyone. Okay.